bringing a Stone Age dwelling construction to life, a joint experimental venture of local volunteers and archaeological scientists. Public participation in archaeological projects is becoming ever more essential, and experimental archaeology is an excellent way of reaching out and creating a scientific community in which both the general public and scientists can engage in a continuous learning and listening experience. In the town of Vlaardingen, near the port city of Rotterdam, local volunteers have set up an open air archaeological educational center about the archaeology of the Rhine Meuse Delta, called Massamuda, where school children and others learn about the past of their region. This slide shows the layout of the Massamuda Educational Center, where in 2016, Volunteers of the center, along with staff and students of Leiden University, built a reconstruction of a late Neolithic house plan using Stone Age tools only. We focused on the building process, documenting the entire Chen Operatoire by quantifying as much as possible the amount of building materials required, the labor input, and how much time different actions took. We also meticulously documented the amount of tool use because all tools form part of the Leiden Experimental Reference Collection for Micro Analysis. This house is the location and focus of a new collaborative and interdisciplinary project entitled Putting Life into Late Neolithic Houses, <coughs> investigating domestic craft and subsistence activities through experiments and material analysis, subsidized by the Dutch Research Council MBO. This project aims to bring together academics of different backgrounds, archaeological companies, public parties like museums and open air centers, craftspeople and artists. Here you see pictures and logos of the team members. The period we are talking about is the late Neolithic, more specifically the Vlaarninger culture, dating between 3400 and 2500 BC. The sites attributed to this culture share a particular repertoire of pottery, but are otherwise rather variable, especially where it concerns their landscape location. Vlaarninger sites are mostly found in the wetland context of the Rhine-Meuse Delta, on the coastal dunes, the river levees, the peat area, and even occasionally on the sandy uplands of the southeast. We attempt to fill in the details of daily life around the Masamuda house by addressing a series of research questions. What kind of crafts were carried out? How did people process and cook their food? How did they furnish their houses? Are there differences in the daily activities people carried out between sites located in different environmental settings? How did they move around this water-rich landscape? And what kind of interactions existed between the inhabitants of these different sites? Team members in this new project have a very varied background, academic and non-academic, including botanists, archaeological scientists, historians, chemists, woodworkers, and artists. Although main, many Vlaardingen sites have been excavated, detailed scientific material analysis has rarely been carried out. Our methodologies include microanalysis of toolkits in order to infer past activities like hide working. And we are also interested in food waste, studied by means of residue analysis of pottery, through mass spectrometry and the study of food crusts with a scanning electron microscope. The project is now running for two years and we are getting some interesting results. Research by Lucy Kubiak Martens of Food Crusts on Pottery from Den Haag Steinhof, located on the coastal dunes, shows lots of evidence for cooking emmer wheat. In contrast, such evidence is completely absent at the type site of Vlaardingen, located on a river levee. Could this be interpreted as a difference between temporary and permanently occupied sites? Further cooking experiments and research of more pottery are forthcoming. Oh. Micro analysis of flint, bone and antler tools reveals toolkits that function in craft activities, the perishable products of which are usually not preserved archaeologically. Unretouched flint flakes were used to cut and splint, split plant materials and may be linked with wicker work or making fish traps. Bone awls 
have plant working traces that were interpreted as resulting from making coiled baskets with a grassy plant. Some analysis of experimental bone awls reveals clear differences between the traces of wool and those of flux, so we are hoping to get more detailed picture of the use of fibers during the, fib uh, the flower period. The microanalysis analysis of the flint assemblages by Lasse van den Dickenberg shows distinct differences between the two sites so far studied. At Den Haag Steinhof, located on the dunes and indicated in the graph in blue, height working seems very prominent, whereas wood, bone and antler working traces are more abundant in the levee site of Hekelingen, indicated in red. The latter site also has a lot of worked bone of red deer, like owls and chisels. These diverse landscape settings, each offering different raw materials and resources, begs the question as to what are the relationships between these sites? Do they have different functions? What kind of connectivities existed between their inhabitants and between them and the people on the Pleistocene uplands to the south and southeast? We therefore also focus on provenancing the various raw materials, like that of the flint axis that you see below, which was found on the coast but came from the remote Hesbe area in Belgium. Such contacts and exchanges must surely have taken place along the rivers, which are the highways of the wetlands. Although we focus on the Rhine-Meuse Delta, indicated in, this, in, the red, in the blue circle, we also study the raw material connections with the site further inland, classified as Vlaarninger culture on the basis of pottery, uh, pottery typology. It's the little red dot. Petrographic research of pottery samples from Den Haag Steinhof and the type site of Vlaarninger by Dennis Braakmans show the former to be mostly quartz tempered and the latter mostly tempered with grit and feldspar. Analysis of ceramics from other Vlaarninger sites may show what this variability may mean. This interest in mobility and connectivity led to our first joint project by the Putting Life team and the Masamuda volunteers, the construction of a dugout. Because the Vlaarninger culture is a wetland culture for which we assume that people's mobility largely took place over water, this was a logical choice. The work was carried out entirely by the Masamuda volunteers, supervised by the woodworking in our team, Leo Wolterbeek. The volunteers meticulously monitored their activities, the tools they used, and their experiences. The dugout was a place around which many discussions took place, involving people with all kinds of backgrounds. This ongoing discussion led to our first uh, visualization, made by the artists in our team, Kelvin Wilson. Everyone's expertise was invaluable, and the input added up to an increasingly detailed image of how and where the dugouts could have been made. We concluded that such a large oak, such as we used for our dugout, could not be found in the wetlands. Instead, people must have gone inland to obtain such a tree. To have a large straight oak tree without side branches, the tree must have been surrounded by other trees in order to grow straight up to the light. It therefore cannot have stood near the river shores. After felling, the trunk would have been too heavy to haul back to the water. Our trunk weighed circa three tons. The production process must therefore have taken place at the location of felling, away from the shore. A finished canoe was much easier to pull back to the water than a large log. The dugout took 491 hours to make. Hence, we estimate that it would take three to four weeks with four people, with circa four people to complete, using for the most part flint axes and edges, as well as wooden tools. This meant they would have had to set up camp in the woods. And you see in the, uh, the little dwelling here in the background and circled in red. Indeed, we do find evidence for such possible encampments at the site of Hekelingen. We hypothesized that the best time to carry out this task was in the autumn, when harvesting was over. Autumn is also a good time to collect nuts and to hunt red deer or fur animals, 
which are best killed in this season. All these foodstuffs and raw materials could be transported back in the new canoe. At Hekelingen, where possible huts were present, bone tool making has been a predominant activity. Last, the autumn is a good time for social gatherings uh, with people from other settlements. Here you see the complete visualis visualization as made by Calvin Wilson, based on the input of the entire Putting Life team and the hands-on experiences of the Masamuda boat builders. The dugout experiment also led to insights about tool use. The work was carried out by a small core of people who through time became very experienced in handling the various tools that were available. Although in the beginning, a few stone axes and adzes got damaged, some beyond repair, this rarely occurred in the end. Their experiences taught the toolmaker in our team, Diederik Pomstra, which morphological features could be improved, especially regarding the hafting arrangements. Another important insight by the volunteers was that a large part of the work could easily be carried out by using wooden tools like hammers, wedges and packs. This concurs with our experience with various other technological processes like house construction, where we have found for wooden tools, often not ever even modified, to be really important in different tasks. The visualizations by Calvin Wilson are published in the social media of Exarc in order to elicit discussions with peers in the field and visitors of the associated open air centers. The volunteers of Masamura have a very have a varied background and many have experience with various crafts or have grown up on a farm. Their experience and insights thus help us to formulate new hypotheses about past daily life that can be tested experimentally and researched through scientific material analyses. To further stimulate the involvement of the Masamuda volunteers, we're organizing workshops in which experienced craftspeople teach both archaeological scientists and Masamuda volunteers about our crafts. Here you see a couple of examples. Several of the people who partook in these workshops are now busy making constructions inside the house, like the attic scene in the bottom right hand picture. Many school classes visit the center and the joint efforts by academics and local volunteers gradually bring the house to life, showing how the people may have lived in, Vla in the Vlaardingen area in the late Neolithic. Discussions and practical interaction with such a varied group of people, each with their own knowledge and experience, have raised new questions not previously posed by archaeological scientists. These, in turn, have opened up new research avenues and alternative interpretations to be explored by means of scientific analysis and further experiments in a continuous dialogue. A common feature of the Masamuda volunteers is their background as local citizens, in most cases not educated as archaeologists and historians, but there is a specific curiosity for what people in the past did hundreds of thousands or two thousands of years ago on their home ground. With the accumulation of archaeological knowledge provided by the ongoing research carried out in the Putting Life project, these volunteers are frequently more able than academically trained archaeologists to disseminate the fascinating stories that come to life at Masamura. They are the true interpreters of the past, telling the stories and making the joint research of the Putting Life team and their own contributions available for a broad audience. Last, the scientific knowledge and practical expertise obtained by the volunteers through interaction with traditional craftspeople and archaeological scientists is transferred to the school children and visitors of the Masamuda Park, ensuring a teaching learning continuum far outlasting the current research project. In this way, we hope to involve next generations in not only thinking about the past, but also in partaking in sustainable crafts stimulating their tactile interaction with natural materials that are pivotal in past technology. By thus contributing to a better understanding of the place where they live, they will become more aware of the dynamics of the Delta landscape and its inhabitants through the millennia.
Thank you for your intention.